Yeah, thank you very much. Also, thank you very much for inviting me and having me here. Argentina is a beautiful country, and small talk is, of course, also a beautiful language. But I'm going to talk about a bit what's actually wrong with small talk. So, I have the hypothetical question what if you would need to use small talk to build applications and use the multiple cores you have in your nice little laptops, perhaps even in your phones? and in other devices. So, what's, what's the problem with that? Well, if you look at Smalltalk, one of the good things about Smalltalk is it actually hasn't changed a lot because it was like very good and nice from the beginning. But the bad thing about Smalltalk is it hasn't changed a lot. So, if you look at how the hardware developed, we actually see a lot of changes. As I said, there are all kinds of different devices that now have more than a single core. So you can actually do multiple things in parallel and you have to do that to get the performance out of the systems. The last couple of decades we saw like a steady rise of the processor speed so that's just looking at standard Intel machines. Um, the last couple of years we actually see there is no rise of performance anymore. If you just look at the speed of these processors, at 4 gigahertz, they kind of leveled out. That has physical reasons, like we, we can't really cool those machines. We can't really put them into mobile devices because they just take too much energy to work with. And so the engineers, they had some clever ideas. OK, what can we do to not get it, let it get too hot? Well, we can just build multiple cores instead of making them just faster. Well, for us as a programmer, that's a problem. So you might wonder, should you care? Why would I use multiple cores? Well, I don't know how you earn your living, but if I imagine that you implement something like these SAP business forms or web forms or web pages, um, basic input, the user fills in a name and something. For that, well, you might not actually need multiple cores. But if you do anything beyond that, if you do like layouting algorithms, if you do graphics, if you do anything that consumes performance, games, multimedia, um, if you have to process a lot of data, monitor stuff, if you have to use very low power devices with a lot of cores but very slow cores, then you will need it. And even if you don't need it today, tomorrow if you go, for instance, on your mobile phone, then those processors have less performance and you will need it. Okay, the question now is how can we actually develop applications in such an environment where we have multiple cores and how would we imagine to write software for that world? Let me give one simple example, a mail client. I suppose everyone is using a mail client today that can be Gmail and as a web application or like I'm having here a Mac uh, and use a mail application of the Mac. They are very simple and very similar. So. The main idea, of course, you have a user interface. The user interacts with the system, and what happens is you type on keys, you move the mouse, you maybe have a touch screen on your mobile phone, and those uh, interactions generate events the user interface has to process. And the idea here is usually, if you look into these libraries, they have an event loop which waits on events to process one after another. If we now think about how would that work in a system with multiple cores, then if you look into the research literature, people came up with all kinds of different ideas. Two of them are called active objects or event loop actors. And those basically provide additional software engineering um, properties like isolating things so that you can do multiple things uh, next to each other without interfering with each other. And for the user interface part of such an application, Actually, something like event loop actors is a perfect fit because you still have the idea of an event loop, but you also get like isolation. However, there is more to a mail application. A mail application also has all the data it has to store. Then you have the interaction coming from the network, you get incoming messages, you get maybe a synchronization service with your address book somewhere online, and all these kind of things. So there are multiple parties, also the user is creating content, creating new addresses or creating uh, new emails and all the data has to be kept consistent somewhere. Typically if you look into these applications there's a database in the back end and the database as I tried to show here is basically 
So for the mail application, it's an SQL Lite database. And they actually use the transaction support to be able to run multiple activities in parallel. So you have the, the network layer uh, receiving emails, and you have the user creating stuff. And to get that consistent into the database, they use transactions. If you would think how, OK, we have the database, what would we do in small talk? Well, for instance, the gemstone people, they offer like a transactional system. So you might want a software transactional memory actually in your small talk as a natural extension to the database. So you have only one programming model to think about. So that would be another good fit here. But that's very different from the event loop stuff uh, for the user interface. So you actually need support for multiple models. And then even more, if you actually want to, to go further and you have all these emails and you want to try to find them, like here we have a simple search query. So you actually have to dig through all that data. And if you have multiple cores, you want to use them to get faster and uh, yeah, low latency results to give the user a better user experience. And for these kind of things, you typically want to use, again, a very different programming model. So here I just list like data parallel queries. People came up with all kinds of libraries to do that. Then you have like MapReduce style programming, which automatically can do um, these kind of requests in parallel, or fog join, which is more like recursive programming to really use the multiple cores of your system. And for all that, well, you either need like library support or virtual machine support. But uh, well, the main point I try to make here is you have at least these three different kind of problems, usually more. And then you have the question, OK, there are perhaps libraries, maybe not in Smalltalk, maybe in Java and so on. But you always have to choose the right tool for the job. And the main question here is for people building uh, languages like Smalltalk or virtual machines, what, what can we actually use? What should we offer? What should we support? And well, my personal opinion here is there is no silver bullet. You cannot just choose one. You want to choose different tools for different parts of the application. And if you go into, into the direction of Smalltalk, well, then one of the most important ideas of Smalltalk, I think, is that we want actually to empower the library builders and the language builders to have high-level abstractions. Because as the last talk said, Smalltalk is like a live image, and you have all that power at your hands, and you want to be able to use it. So what do people typically do? Well, they start building like more high-level abstractions like domain-specific languages. So maybe not the nicer syntax, but like libraries that really read like natural language to describe a certain problem to really be able to formulate efficiently uh, your algorithm, but also in a way that the machine under the hood actually can use it. And well, you can also do that with different syntax. There are all kinds of parsing libraries, usually, and ideas of language workbenches that allow you to build languages on top of small talk. OK, if we go with that kind of approach, the question is, ah, OK, how can we actually implement these different kind of concurrency and parallel programming models. And people have stumbled over quite a lot of problems, especially if you have a language like Smalltalk or Java. They are, in the sense, very similar that they have the notion of shared memory and the notion of like Smalltalk processes or threads, which you usually have problems with if you have to do things in parallel, then you have to synchronize on a very low level. In your Smalltalk image, you find, will find like a mutex and semaphores, and that's all very low-level stuff, and synchronization is hard. And if you want to build very high-level abstractions, then you have these kind of problems here. So when I talked about event loop vectors, I said isolation is one of the main properties of that, that model that allows you to actually get the software engineering benefits of having different entities working next to each other without interfering with each other. And if you want to build such an abstraction, you actually need to get like state encapsulation and safe message passing right. Otherwise, you send over an object, and the other actor keeps on to that object and modifies it behind your back. And you have race conditions, and you need synchronization again, and so forth. And well, the question is, how can we actually solve that? If you look at people implementing these kind of languages on top of JVMs or Smalltalk, 
they always run into problems that they either have to make a very complicated implementation, use things like type systems, which are not natural to small talk, on top of the small talk to actually be able to use a compiler to get it right, or they have to do very dynamic checks and that costs a lot of performance and so on. So there are a lot of problems in that direction. Then you have other problems I listed here. I'm not going to go into all to that. Um, if you're really interested, I listed here papers uh, to read about that. But let me mention one more thing, immutability. It's typically a very simple example. So the idea is that you have an object which cannot really change. That's something really nice in a concurrent environment because you can just hand it over to your different activities and they all have the guarantee that every time they look at it, it will not have changed. And that's something really hard to, to implement. Some, some small talk virtual machines, I think, provide uh, support for that. They have an additional flag somewhere in the object which says, ah, okay, every time uh, you're going to change a field here, there is an exception or something like that. But uh, if you don't have Smalltalk uh, VM support for that, that's hard to realize. So my question for my own research was, what can we do? How can we actually build a Smalltalk that's really an open system that really has the capabilities of implementing different kinds of language abstractions? And one thing I was really missing from the Smalltalk I was using, so the Faro Smalltalk, is the ability to redefine the language behaviors. And in the Lisp world, I have that common language object system with a meta object protocol. And the definition of that basically says that meta object protocol is an interface to the language. And it allows to modify the language's behavior and all that within the language itself. So that's what I really liked. So the idea of not only having objects, but also being able to actually change the behavior of my language. Okay, and taking that idea, um, I came up uh, with a simple meta object protocol of my own to actually approach the question of how can we implement different concurrency abstractions on top of a small talk virtual machine. And what you see here is basically the whole meta object protocol. The main idea is that you have a notion of an owner. So every object in your, in your system, every object in your image has one certain domain that it belongs to, exactly one. And that domain owns that object and defines for each of the objects it owns what the basic operations on that object actually mean. So what you see in the top of that definition is read field and write field and the session handlers. So you can actually get for, for every operation of reading or writing an event and you can redefine what the meaning for that is. And in addition to that, you have request execution of a certain selector on an object, and you can also redefine the execution of that. And uh, in our small talk, um, in the Faro small talk, you also have to take care of like primitives in the virtual machine to redefine those semantics to actually get the proper uh, language semantics you want. And you have things like global state, which is always a problem in concurrent programming. Every global, well, even in your normal sequential program, globals are kind of a uh, bad smell usually, but in concurrent world, that's even worse. Yeah. Um, one more thing. Well, I call it here a thread or a small process, and that actually executes inside a domain. So every thread knows in which domain it executes and basically has a notion of uh, which language semantics it actually now has to, to obey. Okay. That's probably very abstract. So let me give you an example. Yeah. How could we realize the immutability I was talking about? How can we actually make sure that if you don't have such a specific flag as I was mentioning um, in the virtual machine, how can we actually do that? So just uh, starting out with a simple example. Um, we have here, yeah, just, just a cell object that's initialized. That code is basically the setup for the program and we initialize that cell so it has only one object field uh, with the value foo. And then we actually ask that immutable domain, I will show you the definition in a second, um, to adopt that cell. So as I said, every object has an owner. And now that cell is 
owned by the immutable domain. And if we then actually go to what I call enforced execution, which is the actual language level which you would run your application in, then what ha should happen is if we actually execute the set again, then we get an error here. And that should be an immutability violation. So if you now look at what actually happens under the hood, we have again here just a simple sequence diagram, the same program. Um, we create the cell, we set it to foo, we adopt it, and then we switch to enforced execution. And now you see, instead of just performing the set bar here, like we did the set foo, we actually redirect to the immutable domain and reify that message sent to be able to specify a specific policy for it. And what happens here is uh, nothing special because well, immutability doesn't have the notion of execution, so we don't need to adapt anything, and our set is eventually just executed directly. However, when the set method actually arrives at the point where we write to that object field, we again get such an intercession handler, and we can redefine the semantics and throw an immutability error instead of actually performing the write to that object field. And if you look at the domain definition for that, for that whole uh, immutable domain, we see it's very simple. Here we have just a list of intercession handlers and that's a write to the field with a certain index of an object and instead of actually performing it, you just signal an error. And well, I mentioned the primitives in the virtual machine, so that's the low level stuff that actually allows us to do something useful. Um, here we actually just also change the semantics of that, capture that set or that at a certain index we put a value into usually an array or collection and we, we also redefine that to signal an error. And you can imagine all the other mutating operators have to be handled the same way. So, and with that, with that kind of meta object protocol, we have that domain definition where we can specify the policies and now we have actually without having to change, besides supporting that made object protocol on a virtual machine, without having to change a lot, we can really specify our own um, semantics. Okay. <clears throat> Let me give you two more examples what we can actually build with that. So I mentioned that event loop actors can be a good example for a concurrency uh, concept when you have user interfaces and you want to process events. So I guess uh, most of you might have played on an old Nokia phone with a snake game. Just a raise of hands to see that you understand me. Perfect, okay, great. Okay, how can we imagine how that works? So here on the side, let's just imagine we have actually a game with two and both players are artificial intelligences to have it easy. So what we can see here is Every of these rounded boxes has that kind of mailbox and actually these two AI players, they send messages to the agent in the middle, to the um, actor. And that actor contains the actual play field with the snake uh, representations in terms of objects. The important part here is that the communication is completely explicit and all these three activities can actually run in parallel if they would want to. And what is, mo again, what is important in addition, not just the communication is explicit, but also you have no way to actually access the field, the game field, to change the state behind the back of that actor in the middle, which enforces the game rules. So if you have the notion of security, you don't have the, the problem that the malicious activity actually could change and play around the rules and cheat. So there is no hidden object sharing, there is no shared state you would have to synchronize to get the semantics right. And yeah, so based on that only the owning actor of an object actually can change it in that um, example. <coughs> okay, let's, let's define this uh, meta object protocol I proposed. Let's define how an actor actually works. So as I mentioned, every actor has a mailbox on the top and in addition, it has a process which actually executes the event loop 
to process the incoming messages. And we derive that actor actually from the domain class. Then we initialize it. The mailbox is just a shared queue. We assume that's something um, yeah, a virtual machine implementer or library implementer got right, did all the synchronization necessary, has the nice properties, and everything we want. And we don't worry about that, just the library we use. Um, then the process that is the event loop, we say we spawn here in that domain, so it's executing as part of the domain. And what it will do is just while true, execute all the incoming messages. And the incoming messages will just use the mailbox, block on it, wait for the next message, process it. And what we see here is then at the end also um, the return value of that message then is then returned to the actual sender in term of a promise. For, for the message sending between um, the different actors, you want to redefine that not, and if you have the normal small talk, you send a message to an object and that message is directly executed synchronously and you will directly get the result. But uh, in that actor model, you, you basically have to enforce that inside an actor it's okay. As you can see here, we test whether self is a current domain we are executing in and if that's okay, then we will just perform the reflector uh, selector directly and we have the same semantics as a normal small talk program. However, if you send from, from external, so these two actors are just interacting, sending an asynchronous message. So basically, if the test fails, if self is not the current domain, but if you are coming in from the outside, then we will send an asynchronous message. And that works by um, basically creating a message object and just and queuing it into the message queue. And with that, the actual receiver actor can um, process a message whenever it has time to do it and doesn't have any problems with consistency or parallel execution and no need for additional synchronization. So, as I said, one of the main ideas is that there is only one process and we also have that additional handler here uh, request thread resume that basically is always triggered when the process starts to enter a domain and execute on that. And here we just signal an error because there's only a single activity in our actor. Okay, and well, that's, that's kind of abbreviated, but uh, it's not too much abbreviated. So what you saw, the code on these slides, is actually the implementation I use for my um, little actor languages on top of Smalltalk. So with that object meta protocol, you can actually very concisely implement these policies. And then if you just imagine how an application actually could look like, well, let's do it a bit simpler than, than the example with a snake. Here, just a calculator. So the calculator object basically is created inside the new actor, and we get the reference to it. Um, the actor itself is not really of interest, but we want to interact with the calculator object. And then we have that that example code here, and we just, we just try to add two numbers. So very simple example, and basically what happens here is that if that's executed, we get returned a promise, as I said on the slides before. We don't actually synchronously execute it, but as you can see here, we send that asynchronous message, and when that message gets processed, then we actually get the result at some point in time we will resolve that promise and actually execute um, that activity. Important here is that approach has a lot of uh, better engineering properties than simple threats because by deferring that activity and making sure that it actually executes in our client actor in the end, we avoid race conditions on a very low level. And Actually, we, we first execute that always first in the transcript that will show up because our sending at to um, the calculator actor is in the same event um, as the other code. And that when resolved is an additional event that just comes in when the result of um, the calculating actor comes back. So that means that at any point in time, in any of these actors, there's really just one activity, and you have always a consistent state. Nobody is going to change something behind your back 
what you don't expect. Okay, that's, that's one example. Another example um, in my mail application was a software transaction on memory. So how can we actually implement that? Let's imagine a simple example always found in that kind of uh, scenario. Transferring money between two banks. That's a transaction you, and you want to make sure that there is no money actually lost in, yeah, in any steps uh, that have to happen between uh, those two banks. So what has to happen for that is the software transaction on memory has to track all um, state changes for you. If you if you don't want to use an SDM, then you usually want to use like locking, and you have to get the locking policies right. You have to know all the involved um, activities and all the involved um, bank accounts, and get locking order right to avoid deadlocks and all that kind of stuff. And you don't want that uh, usually because that's hard to get right. And an SDM basically does it behind the back and tries to get it right for you. So you get nice properties like atomicity, uh, consistency, and isolation between different activities. They have a way to, you as a programmer have a way to reason about a transaction in one go. That's one sequential uh, snippet. So if you see here the actual transfer method on our bank, um, then we have a withdraw, which is normally an activity on its own. Uh, and it's independent of the deposit operation. So we have to have some way to coordinate these updates to not lose money or not to create money. And what we do here is we actually ask the SDM to execute that block atomically to get all the nice SDM properties. Um, the ex implementation I'm going to show you is based on something Lucas Rangley did, a guy from Bern. And um, the code is actually available and you can use it. So the main idea is that you try to track all the state updates and that you actually represent objects uh, by multiple copies. That's also not the most efficient implementation you can imagine, but it's a very simple implementation strategy you can reason about. So you have that account object with a balance, and you get a working copy on which you in your transaction can directly apply all the updates. And you have a notion of the previous state of your bank object, uh, account object, which keeps the previous data to be able to compare it to the current one, to, to be able to see if there are actually inconsistencies because multiple transactions have been performed on the same object. And then if you actually do the commit, what happens is we compare the previous version we just uh, remembered in our transaction with the original one. And if that succeeds, we can actually apply all uh, the changes we did in our transaction in one atomic step and get the nice STM properties. So we don't have to do locking, we don't have to acquire locks in the right order, we don't have to prevent deadlocks here. That is all done by the system. So give me just uh, one example how that works. So if we execute that code here, so we initialized all these uh, account objects with some values and we start to do actually the transfer, then what happens first is we do the implementation of that restore method which sets the balance of our A account. And that's, well, normally we would have to acquire a lock here to do that first. Because other activities now could go. But since we actually work on that working copy and not on the original object, we don't have a problem here. So in a second uh, step, we then just deposit the money on the account B. And again, that happens completely isolated on our working copy and independent of any other possible activities in the system. And then only the atomic commit actually updates uh, A and B because we saw they didn't change between the previous versions. If there would have been another activity, we would have to retry uh, that transaction. Well, if you can briefly look at the code, well, as you might expect it, here we see the object implements a working copy method, and that working copy basically creates our change object for us, which creates basically the two copies we need, the previous object and the working copy. And there is not a lot of magic going on. Um, the has conflict basically implements the check whether the previous and the original one are identical. And if not, then we have a conflict and we need to abort the transaction. 
And as we can see here in the transaction implementation, we have a commit method that basically says, okay, well, we stop the world at that point in time. If a transaction commits, we stop the world. We check whether our previous versions of these objects are still consistent with the ones that are currently in the world. If that's okay, then everything is fine and we can just apply all our changes to our objects and then resume the build. Well, that's a very simple SDM, but it's a nice uh, way to reason about the problem. The big question now is how actually can we use the beta object protocol to track the state access? And as you can see here, we just change the semantics of reading and writing fields. We don't really have to change anything beyond that. So instead of directly applying a read field, we actually go to our working copy, which will, if it's executed the first time, create a now a new change object with all the different versions of the object. And then we can set the instance variable at a given index and actually work on the working copy. Similar, the write also works on the working copy instead of the original object. Well, um, just as a side note, primitives are again a problem here, so we have to re-implement them uh, or basically provide semantics so that we can change um, uh, all the, the proper uh, read and write field operations to track our state changes. Normally the primitive is really in the virtual machine and we wouldn't know what it actually changes in our objects. And here that example is working on a stream and the stream is an object with a collection of um, yeah, typically an array or something with a collection of characters, for instance, and we need to, to re-implement it in our case here. But uh, beyond that, basically we get, well, we get to implement our software transactional memory in small talk without changing the virtual machine, yeah. and then use that meta object protocol to do the hard part. We can actually track all state access. Okay. <clears throat> You might now wonder, okay, there is a good reason why Smalltalk doesn't have normally uh, that kind of meta object protocol. And uh, one reason for that is performance, and another reason is what can we actually use it for. So, just as a reminder, so that's supposed to represent all the kind of research that's out there. People have been doing research on concurrency and parallelism for 70 years, and there's a lot of stuff out there. But uh, if you actually look at uh, what, what are the, con the specific concepts you want to support, then we actually see there are a really a lot of them that we actually can directly implement in libraries and we don't really need virtual machine support for that. But there are also quite a couple of uh, concepts, for instance the SDM, for instance the event loop actors that read, really need a lot of uh, support from the virtual machine because people typically struggle to implement it on top of existing VMs without decent support. And, well, um, I think the, the slides will be available online somewhere if you want to look into the details, but there are really a couple of interesting um, concurrency concepts that need support from the VM. If you imagine how um, you can implement that, the implementation I have um, the AST transformation. That's one of the implementations. So you actually don't need to change the virtual machine. The drawback here is that it's damn slow. So what I did in addition is I also went into the virtual machine and do it properly and changed basically the semantics of all the bytecodes and all the primitives in the VM to support that meta object protocol. And if you do that, you get a lot better performance. So what you can see here is the gray bar is um, on top of uh, the cock virtual machine with the AST uh, based implementation. That's damn slow. That's going up to like 50 times slower than normal. Um, and the best case is, I think, like two times slower than normal. That's not really what you want for your application. If we look into the other implementation, the light gray, um, actually we get a lot better results. We are almost on par with the standard um, implementation and we are like in between uh, 10 and 20 percent overhead. And we get all the nice benefits of that meta object protocol. We can really stay away from the virtual machine. We can implement our stuff, our properties in Smalltalk. Okay, 
Well, I was starting out that Smalltalk isn't really ready. And, well, it's, it's not. So we need something in Smalltalk to be able to provide different kind of concurrency abstractions you need to use for the different problems you have in the world. And so my personal uh, opinion is that the Smalltalk community kind of needs to wake up. Smalltalk as it is, is not perfect. There are so many different uh, machines now out there. The whole idea of parallelism was never like part of the design considerations for Smalltalk. Smalltalk is a nice living system, but things like uh, become primitive. What kind of semantics does it have if you actually have multiple activities running in parallel? And there are all kind of other language quirks that are problematic. So people have to, to start reinventing Smalltalk for the parallel world. So my take on that is basically that Smalltalk should be an open-ended system and that you want to have something like a meta-object protocol, maybe the one I propose here, maybe something else. Maybe there are also other solutions to the problem, but uh, more or less there is no silver bullet. So we cannot just go and implement one specific concurrency model into Smalltalk Actors are a really nice model, but they have their problems. So just supporting actors is probably not what you um, need for all the different tasks. So, but uh, if you have such, an, such a meta-object protocol, is that already the happy end? Because I showed you that I can implement all that kind of different stuff on top of the VM directly in Smalltalk. Well, I can provide you with the right tools for the different abstractions. But unfortunately, there is still uh, stuff left to do. So if we go back to my calculator example, we have that implementation of a calculator here. So there is an add method, just add A to B, and that basically just does B plus A, right? So that's straightforward, that's an addition. You probably wouldn't need that method here. But uh, what happens if we actually use it in our application? So that's the code I showed you in the other example. So then we send here. We assume that we actually execute here in a, in a small talk that supports actors based on my meta object protocol. So we execute that part inside an actor and that calculator was outside in another actor so we have to do our stuff asynchronously. And if you just look at that code here, then we actually can't see why it returns a future in the end. So why would we want to do that here? If we just look at the calculator definition, we don't see that it returns anything else but probably a number or something. But here we actually have to, to register a callback and do all that kind of stuff and that's not really convenient. Some people argue also that programming style is not really nice. So what is going on here? So the meta object protocol gives us, gives us all the power to change the language semantics. But for a programmer, the poor person who actually has to maintain the code, there's a lot of magic going on and well, what we, what we really need here is some proper language design, some proper ideas, how to actually have perhaps a small talk dialect, perhaps a domain specific language to do that kind of programming so that the user actually sees what's going on in the code. Because if you have all that magic in the back, then you have to read all parts of the system to really understand what's going on. Um, to just give one example how that could be done. Closure is a kind of popular language on the JVM. It's a lispy language, so some people don't like it because you have all these parentheses. But the ideas behind the language are interesting. So, okay, closure starts as a functional language, and here the, the focus is really on, ah, okay, let's design a lisp for the parallel world, for the world with concurrency and all these synchronization issues. And one important design aspect was here, Let's use persistent or immutable data structures. So you have the functional world, you have the idea that you actually don't change objects, but you always get new copies back. And what they do, they integrate it very nicely with the software transactional memories, with something they call agents, which is very similar to the actors I was talking about, and with atoms, which are very low level synchronization me mechanisms. And as you can see here, just that brief example, they actually try to have a very uniform way to think about these different abstractions. And they provide different methods to actually change, for instance, references to objects in that, uh, 
yeah, functional language, so they allow some, some certain uh, degree of mutation and that has the same kind of signature as all the other um, mutating operations in that language, which is a very nice thing for the programmer because the programmer can just reuse different libraries in the different contexts of the different parts of the language and that's all like uniform and nicely integrated. So <coughs> language design is still an open issue. We have, if you want to use such a meta-object protocol, we have all the power in our hands. We have the power of a really object-oriented system with the living objects, but the language design for the actual users is hard. So let me close with that slide. Again, we have all the problems coming with the multi-core revolution. We have multiple cores. We need to use them to actually get the necessary performance for our different kind of applications. And for me, the question is, well, do you actually need, need it? Do you have problems you want to solve? And if so, what would be the right tool to solve these problems? OK, thank you. Questions? Yeah, Igor. One of the ideas of why it's on an object level is that you actually sometimes want to send a message to another actor and that's something I didn't see, uh, show here, but then you want to change the owner of that particular message object and perhaps also the object graph that belongs to it and you want to have the full control over which objects actually change the owner. So that was one reason um, to, to go with that granularity. If I would want to imagine uh, something higher level than that. Um, well, you, you can change like the representation and have like group of, group of objects perhaps based on the actual part of the heap in the virtual machine um, which defines that kind of owner. But I still would argue that it should be something per object because otherwise you make like an upfront design decision which afterwards restricts what you can actually do and other people, well, basically they see the problem that per object ownership is not in all the time what you want. If you have like a big array, you might actually want to have uh, different owners for different slices to express different uh, uh, semantics for the different parts. But uh, so in that sense, going um, coarse, more coarse grains than an object is probably too harsh of a restrict restriction. But uh, yeah, that will that will probably need uh, more investigation, more exp playing with different kind of abstractions. The point is that most of objects uh, live quite short and, and they don't need to have a... Uh, I mean, the point is that in the system, <coughs> you don't have too many actors. Uh, yes. Only a, few of the, only a few of the objects actually the are Right, right. So, so what I what I would do here. Exactly. Right, right. So, so one thing um, you could do is actually representing the ownership not just with an object field, but with the region in the heap that's allocated. So you could say every um, actor is, sorry? 
No, no, it's well. It's more like a garbage collection technique people sometimes use. So you have different memory pages that actually upfront belong to a certain actor, and then you have the allocation directly in that memory uh, page, and you have implicitly the knowledge that that object belongs to to that actor. So that would be a very efficient representation, um, and that's probably something something to explore in a real production-ready implementation. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry? Have you tried to turn plan this model application for the RI1? At the beginning of the talk, you were mentioning limitations and coherency. What do you hear from the experts that you tried to turn? I haven't implemented any like really complex <coughs> application. One big problem is that well, I would have to start implementing all the necessary libraries. If you compare what's available in the Faro small talk um, with what's available for JVM, there you got a lot more stuff. So there is a much bigger library ecosystem. So typically you want to rely on that. Um, when I showed you that, that Q implementation, that's an essential part of getting the actor model right um, that behind the back is used here. That's actually not safe. If I would run that on the raw VM, the way we have it now, you will probably encounter race conditions. So if you want to build really high level applications, complex systems, then you would first need to invest in a lot of infrastructure, unfortunately. So that's one other aspect. The small talk is just not ready. All the libraries I know are not ready for parallel or concurrent uh, use. That's actually interesting because I think that that kind of idea correlates a lot with uh, what we do. Um, as you mentioned, uh, I'm working with David Unger on a research project. And there the idea is that you actually want to avoid to over-synchronize your system and that you want to embrace the kind of non-determinism you actually get out of that. And um, he thinks about the idea of having programs written in a like race and repair style. So you actually can have applications racing and you can have low-level data races, but you, you use like a defensive programming strategy that you have like points where you then try to reconcile um, the perhaps different results. The, the drawback here is that people usually don't expect uh, that they get less accuracy. So typically people have a very, very like, uh, yeah, fixed, uh, everything has to be very precise. What they forget is that you have things like floating point numbers, which are also just approximations. And in the same sense, um, you could think about race conditions as something that introduces certain um, inconsistencies that actually are like, in the end, if you really need that precision, then you can synchronize and then you can try to fix it up. But you might not always need that. And for performance, you might just have them stumble and uh, one of the, the runners will be first in the, the run and perhaps the second one is also still fast and only one activity kind of stumbled and has to, to keep up then and uh, gets in a bit later. But yeah, so, so there are kind of uh, different approaches people think about and um, 
Oversynchronization is, of course, a very important uh, performance drawback and the kind of fixing the programming model. That's what I try to say, that you probably want to have different kind of programming models for different problems and use them in, in a way that you actually use the right tool for the job. So, but yeah. Have you found instances where one can write a program that can itself do some of the work of choosing which strategy to use with a feedback mechanism so that you don't have to go to the excruciating detail of, say, dividing 100,000 threads with 100,000 dividers or some such? Mm. Well, I haven't, I haven't really done research in that uh, direction. But for me, that sounds like having adaptive systems also like trying to figure out the same kind or the, the perfect kind of data structure. So if you have an interface in Java, you want basically your system to find whether it should be a vector, an array, or a hash map or something dynamically. And that sounds very much like the same kind of problem, and people have struggled with, with doing that. Just-in-time compilers are an example where you have uh, less smaller search space and can do nice um, adaptive optimizations, but uh, it's not really changing the inherent uh, characteristics of data structures, for instance. So, yeah, if there's a smart person finding something, sure, I'm interested, but I, I don't no, know no, anything. Yeah. Person, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not aware of any. Yeah, that, that depends on what you want to implement. So sometimes in an SDM system, you, you can allow multiple uh, threads working at the same time in the same domain because uh, the semantics of the domain enforces a proper semantics. Okay. So, and then you propose the message set as the boundary for parallelism, sort of. That's, that's the actor model, right. So that, that's one very big definition of this system. And then you place each object, or uh, it could be even at message level, but I think it's at object level. Mm -hmm. You place each object on a domain, so everything an object can do will be done in that task. Eventually. Yep, yep. And objects are not moving around from task to task. They usually implement their own messages in the same task, right? Well, as I mentioned to Igor, um, sometimes you want to actually transfer an object from one domain to another, especially on the message send. So if you produce a result that you don't need anymore in your, your actor as a response to another request, you probably want to transfer the ownership so that the objects really move to the receiver and then the receiver can synchronously work on those objects. But that really depends on the concrete uh, yeah, requirements and performance properties you want, and that's something you would need to implement on top of the meta object protocol, basically. Okay, so then going back to Andre's question and idea, which is what's <coughs> maybe that point where an object will pace is something you're not predicting ahead of time, and it's just a result of the interaction between the objects, and then the object may be moving from one task to another, and then the number of tasks is a variable you can define a runtime Yeah, yeah, certainly. So, so that's uh, something um, the object meta, the ownership-based meta object protocol should provide you with as uh, the abstractions to implement different kind of these models and vary the semantics depending on the use case. But uh, that's not prescribed in itself. So I just presented one certain variation here, and uh, yeah, you can adapt it freely. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.